if you guys, you know, used to go to Night of Champions every year, you'd see him. He was, you know, he looked like he couldn't win the Mr. Long. He couldn't win his class at the teenage Mr. Long Island. That's what he looked like. He he would always show up with no tan. I don't know what happened to him. Maybe he met, got something mentally went wrong with him, but yeah. yeah. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Whatever's on your mind, diet, training, supplementation, life, in and outside of bodybuilding, it is all on the table. Let's get right at the questions. The first two questions, of course, on the show from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, first question, I know you recommend macadamia nut oil for cooking. However, what do you think of, um, I don't know if everyone's going to know what this is, ghee, which is clarified butter, or grass-fed butter for cooking? It's been gaining popularity recently for health benefits as opposed to seed oils. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, you probably know about ghee coming from where yeah. you, you, know, you grew up. That's a big <laughs> Indian, uh, Pakistani delicacy, but because you guys use a lot of dairy. But uh, my whole thing on this is, I, you know, butter is fine for cooking, you know, especially if you're, you know, in the off season. I mean, it's not a big deal. I use macadamia nut oil by convention. And I'll tell you why. Because... I'm a big believer in monounsaturated fats. They're the most heart healthy fats. They really, really improve cholesterol levels, lowering LDL cholesterol. They are very heart healthy. They burn really well in the body. The body seems to have a, a, a real inclination to want to use monounsaturated fats as, as a fuel source. So if I'm going to put fat into my diet, in other words, additional fat, for, like I said, if I'm cooking my eggs in the morning or if I want to add it to my, you know, maybe some rice and chicken that I'm cooking on the stove, sauteing, I use macadamia nut oil. Olive, extra virgin olive oil is, is okay from a health perspective, but you can't really cook with it because it burns too easily. Now, butter or ghee, you know, will get the job done. You can cook with it. It doesn't alter it at all, but it is a saturated fat. Now, how, you know, you, you only need so much saturated fat in your diet. I don't think a little bit is going to be a big deal. But, you know, and I have no problem if I go to a Japanese steakhouse that you put butter on stuff. I, I never tell them to hold the butter. I'm, I'm good with those fats because I don't eat a lot of them. But even for my kids, my kids, you know, like if they have a bagel or an English muffin and they want or even corn on the cob and they want butter on it, I put macadamia nut oil with a little bit of salt. They don't even know the difference. They're like, this is the best butter we ever tasted. So for me... I'd rather give the body, you know, what it really needs and what's really good for it as opposed to, make, you know, using a saturated fat. Personally, I'd like to get my saturated fats mostly from a little bit of red meat, and I eat a lot of eggs. Um, I, I eat at least six eggs every day now. Back in my contest days, I was eating 18, 18 to 24 eggs every single day, and that, that's on, God honest truth. And my cholesterol levels were never high, so we know that that's, that's a myth. So I'd rather get it from those sources. But I don't have a problem. Like, you know, some people are allergic to nut oils, you know, and to nuts, and they can't use those. So for those purposes, I think that that's fine. No problem. Second question, again, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. And, um, you know, we do get a lot of questions where, um, you know, you, there are people talking about these questions. There are people, uh, you know, there, there are recent trends, you know, you see them on social media. So this is another one of them. Uh, a recent somewhat a somewhat recent study on the reverse grip bench press asserts that it activates the upper chest 30% more than the incline presses. Now, you do see this a lot. And the reason that I'm glad that they brought this up, you see a lot of fitness influencers 
uh, talking about the merits of uh, reverse grip bench press. A very well-known trainer has taken it a step further, saying you get the best of both roles by, re by reverse grip pressing on an incline bench. It's an awkward movement that seems to be too much front dealt. Your thoughts? So your thoughts first on just in general the reverse grip, but then I guess taking it a step further on an incline bench. Mm. It's a good question, and I'll tell you why because it's 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 thought provoking. The, the two, only two people I ever knew that were really good reverse bench pressers and did it regularly was Anthony Clark, who had the world record at one point in the bench press at 800 pounds, and the Barbarian Brothers used to reverse grip bench at Gold's Venice, and they had about they had a 500 pound bench. Uh, I never really I was friends with David Paul, but I never really discussed why he did the reverse. I think he just thought it was more comfortable that way, and he had really good triceps. So, and I think Anthony Clark had short arms and it was just good. Personally, you know, from a, an experiential, and I've tried it, it's a, an awkward movement. And I think it places the arm in, in a really anatomically not comfortable position. That doesn't mean you can't build strength like that because a lot of people can, but I, I just don't think that it's, it's mechanically in a, in, a, in a good place. And I'm not a kinesiology expert by any means, but it kind of like it's a weird, awkward position. And whether you're activating upper pec a little bit more or not, that might be true. But it also might be true that you can't go as heavy. And it might also be true that you're more prone to injury. So I always say go for a more natural list, something that feels more comfortable with you. So if, if reverse grip feels more comfortable with you, but then by all means do it. But if you're not really that comfortable in that movement and it feels awkward and like you, you potentially might drop the bar or something like that, then to me, that the risks outweigh the benefits of it. So it, why did it work for Anthony Clark and the Barbarian Brothers? Because it was comfortable for them, and that's why they did it. They, went, they didn't force themselves to do it like that. They, they chose to do it. So, you know, and everyone's anatomy is completely different in their body. And so that's why what works for me won't work for the next person. Lee Priest, who's got short arms, can do dumbbell curls all day long and barbell, and, and barbell curls and grow huge arms. If I do them, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily barbell curls don't work for me. I have to use like cables that are heavy weight, but because I, I, I need that constant tension and range of motion because I have a long arm. So the biomechanics of everyone's a little different. So there's really no right answer to the question. I think for the majority of people, however, the conventional, you know, regular bench press is probably a better way to go. Now these questions, great questions, and a lot more like this are on the Dave Palumbo Experience app which is an app that I have, uh, it's $29 a month to subscribe. You get access to everything I've written, every video I've ever done in one place, all my protocols, cycles, off-season, pre-contest, all my diets are on there. Um, we do a workout every week we put up on there and I answer everyone's questions in an open forum in that, in, in that app. So every, everyone sees everyone's questions and everyone's answers and then I do a Q&A video in addition to that every single week. So you get a lot of value for your money and it's constantly being updated every single week, multiple times a week, a lot of times. And it's always new information. So if you're looking to learn and continuously learn, great, great opportunity. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us on Instagram, official underscore RX muscle. If you're watching us for the first time here on YouTube, we welcome you. We ask that you subscribe below, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our show segments or updates. Of course, right now on the channel yesterday's live episode of after hours and then uh monday rather sunday night's live episode of heavy muscle radio and then of course tomorrow all new episode of iron rage with lee priest um so we actually have a clarification from a question from last week it's from john risotto uh he said he was watching last week's episode he wanted to point out something that he feels may have gotten lost in a bad google translation uh, so he wanted to clarify, Dave. So he's going to ask the question again, I guess, in a corrected manner. So if you're dieting and you're losing weight each week, do you adjust your caloric intake to the new weight or wait until you hit a plateau? As example, I'm 265 pounds. My requirement to lose weight is 2000 cal. Uh, now I lose three pounds a week. Do I leave the calories the same until I plateau or do I drop them by the equivalent up a three pounds loss. Said he was going to text you, but he figured you wanted to use this forum to correct that. I'm pretty sure we addressed this, you know, even if I kind of addressed it in a, in a slightly different approach. 
if you're losing weight, you don't change anything. I've got guys on diets. I, I didn't ever touch the diet for 16 weeks. I didn't touch it because they lost weight consistently and I just played with their cardio and fat burners. Some people, I'm constantly changing their diet because it just doesn't, they're not losing any weight or it's not working, you know? And so it's really person specific. There's no mathematical formula. There's only a mathematical formula to start the process. Here's the initial plan based on your weight and your muscle mass and, and everything. And if you're losing on that plan, then I don't need to change anything. If, if you go six weeks and you're still losing two, three pounds, one, three, one to three pounds a week, whatever it is, and I'm happy with the way your body's changing, I don't change. I'm not going to take away food from you. But if you hit a plateau and you're not losing and I'm giving you more cardio and fat burners and you're still not losing, I have to assume I, you're eating too much at this point, in which case I'll either trim out some of the carbs. If you are eating carbs, trim some of the protein down. Usually I don't touch fats very much unless the, you know, the person's really stuck at the end. So it's usually a, a protein and fat that I'll, I'll whittle down a little bit as they lose weight and maybe they don't need quite as much food. I've had guys who start at 220 and now they're 170 because they're going to, and they're going down to 165 for the, the welterweight class. They absolutely don't need as much food as they did when they were 220, you know? So it, it's really based on the person and, and how they're progressing. One fit mother trucker. So this question is in all caps, which kind of reminds me, Dave, of a back in the day when you used to send emails. I don't know if anyone else ever told you this. Right. Your emails were always in all caps. Do you, do you realize that? No, my emails are never in all my I I, I did accentuate certain words in names caps. and names. Yes. Valentino it, is, is Valentino's all caps. I just will if I want to emphasize a word or a name, like you said, I'll I put caps in there. Yeah. <laughs> So, again, in all caps. Like, Hello, well, like, you could have a cheat meal on Saturday or <laughs> capital O, capital R, Sunday, meaning that people don't say, oh, Dave said to have a cheat meal on Saturday and Sunday. No, it's or, or, you know. Because many times I'd be wondering, like, why is Dave yelling at me? <laughs> no. uh, question is from One Fit Mother Trucker, great name. Yeah. When doing reverse cardio, coming off a prep show, say doing an hour a.m., p.m., what will be the game plan to bring it down? Uh, now, with that being said, I guess the second part of this is that he may be doing another show in a couple of months. So trying to find a sweet spot to maintain before hitting it hard again. Yeah, you know, I, I once again, when I'm working with clients, a lot of times I'll just say, you know what? Let's see how this person looks. If they're really, really still lean and I'm feeding them more, and I'm, I'm, I might say no cardio. And then I might see they start holding a little water. Maybe they're like starting to fill up a little bit. Maybe I actually think they put a little body fat on I might throw two, three days of cardio in a row in and see what their body does. So I kind of play around with it. You really, after a show, you want to kind of give your body a rest so that it gets that anabolic you know, rebound. If you're constantly hammering your body with cardio right after the show's over, it's like, it's like your body's in an overtrained state. It needs the rest. You're not letting it rest. You're overdoing the cardio because you think you're going to get fat. And eventually you burn out and you, and you don't want to do it anyway. So you might as I cut it back quite a bit. Um, I give them a break, you know, if they want to do 20 minutes, you know, two times, three times a week, you know, just because they're in car, because you do go in cardio withdrawal. You know, when I was a distance runner and I was running 10 miles a day, you don't go from running 10 miles every day to stopping. You can't, it's like going off an opioid without, you know, you got to wean yourself down on it. So you have to go from 10 miles a day, you go to six miles, four miles a day, four miles every other day, you know, and, and, and then you come off it like that because otherwise you you can't, you're restless, you can't sleep because you're, it's like that endorphin rush that you get from training. Same thing with cardio. Um, the reason why people can sit and do two hours of cardio a day, you don't just start doing that. Oh, I'm going to start doing cardio today and I'm going to start at two hours. No, you'll never do it. But if you build up to it, it's that endorphin rush. It's like endorphins are basically naturally produced opioids and you get high from them. So after a while, the first five minutes of cardio sucks and then the endorphins get released and it's like you're high. So you don't want to stop almost, you know, I used to remember, I used to do cardio. I, like, I can go, I'm watching TV. I could do another, another hour, no problem, because you're, you're literally high from it. And so you do sometimes have to wean yourself down slowly by doing some cardio daily and then, and then slowly tapering it off. And then when you have a show picked out, all right, I'm going to do a show in four weeks, you start ramping it up again, if necessary. Um, this is one of those that may require some nuances from the Bryant uh the question is about divisions that are no longer at the Arnold Classic. Um, and again, I guess what would we, 
bodybuilding world need to do in order to get these divisions back, citing the fact that he boycotted the pay-per-view because he was irritated about dropping these decisions, you know, citing Linda Murray boycotting the show as well. Uh, he's obviously mentions um, women's bodybuilding, women's physique, figure. Didn't mention 212, but obviously 212 no longer part of the Arnold since I think 2017. Um, in your nuanced opinion, right? I mean, we saw there were less show, uh, less divisions, less competitors to split up over two nights. There was somewhat of an outcry once figure was eliminated um, before this Arnold Classic. Projecting forward, do you think um, there is capacity to bring these divisions back? Do you feel as if, you know, uh, there is something that can be done, I guess, from the competitors, from media, from commentators, to integrate and make this into a positive, whereas, I guess, you know, there are those that are, are hurt over the fact that, you know, some of the their favorite divisions are no longer being featured on one of bodybuilding's biggest stages. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, I have some strong opinions actually about this, believe it or not. And I love the women's divisions as much as I love the men's divisions, but I don't want to see all the divisions featured at the Arnold because it is an invitational show. And I prefer the small lineups like they had at this year's Arnold. I think it's much more palatable to watch and, 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 and analyze. So I like that they cut it back. Okay. But I don't necessarily like the way, the way they cut it back. So having said that, you know, Fitness is great because fitness is entertainment. Arnold's always had fitness from the very beginning, you know, uh, even before it was an NPC IFBB sanctioned event, matter of fact. And I think that that's great because the Arnold Classic is there is an element of, uh, of entertainment when you're watching the show. So that you got to keep fitness, okay? Even if the divisions are not as competitive as they used to be, it doesn't matter. It's entertaining. And then you got to say to yourself, all right, well, this sport is predicated on bodybuilding, right? I mean, Women's bodybuilding is the first division. Now, if you don't want to have women's bodybuilding, you have to have women's physique at least. I mean, essentially, they're they're very similar divisions. So you got to have one of those at least. And then you can pick what the third division is. Whether to me, wellness is just a jacked up bikini. Essentially, it's female bodybuilders that or physique athletes that are doing bikini poses. So it's the same division. So if you you know what I mean, if you're not going to have men's open and two twelve because they're kind of redundant, that's I guess the way Arnold's looking at it. Then you have to, you can't have wellness and bikini because it's kind of like they're redundant with each other as well. So you pick one and you don't have to do the same divisions every single year. Maybe next year you do bikini, fitness, and women's physique. Maybe the year after that you do women's bodybuilding, fitness, and, and, and wellness. You know, I think that would be a better way to shuffle them because I like that three and three. The night show doesn't take forever. But yet it's competitive. It's an invitation. He's not required to hold every division like the Olympia would be. So I just think that they should say, hey, we're going to switch it up every year, but don't put redundant divisions. Maybe instead of having, you know, men's physique one year, you put you put the 212 back in there. You know, there's no you don't have to have the same divisions every single year. Uh, obviously, the men's open has to always be there. Classic is very popular. They're not going to, and Arnold likes that division, so he's never going to get rid of that. And and fitness is very entertaining. So those three divisions will always be stalwarts, but the other three divisions can be can be switched around. And I think that would create more excitement. Don't don't get rid of a division and say it's the girls' fault. You know that I think that was the, the problem that people had a bad taste. If they would have just said, "Hey, look, our new our new setup is we're going to do six divisions: three men, three women's." every year and then we're going to decide at the beginning of each year which divisions we're going to do before we invite people i think that would work great but don't put redundant divisions i think bikini and wellness is to me it was it was almost like a letdown in a sense it's not that i don't like looking at the, the, the physiques because i think the, the women are beautiful but it is bodybuilding we should have a bodybuilding division so you got to have women's physique or you got to have you know fitness or even figure in there somewhere because at least these are you know, balanced, developed physiques. But I would absolutely have either women's bodybuilding or physique every single year. I think it's it's just, it's what built the women's divisions, you know, that part of the sport. Good question here. And another topical question, uh, timely question. Um, it's from PMC Dow Fitness. Do you think physiques like Samson Dowda and Andrew Jack will always beat physiques like a Nick Walker and a hottie Chupon. Again, that uh, debate between structure versus conditioning and, 
you know, whether structure will always win out over. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk of that this week. Uh, your thoughts on, on again, that debate between the likes of a Samson Dowda and an Andrew Jack versus the likes yeah. of a Nick Walker and a Hadi Chupan. And I guess you could also throw in a Derek Lunsford. Yeah. Well, let, let's take even a more extreme example of that. Chris Bumstead. Better structure than Nick Walker, right? But Nick Walker out muscles him by quite a bit. You know, does in an, in a, in a contest who wins? I say Nick Walker because I think he's he's more complete, right? His conditioning is great. So structure doesn't always beat, you know, um, mass and 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 maybe you know and thickness. What it is is who's up there and what they're judging, meaning that. Samson Dowder is not a thin guy. He is complete. He's got a lot of muscle. He's got mass. He's got great symmetry. His weakness is his conditioning isn't always perfect. So that leaves the door open for a guy like Nick Walker to be him. Okay, so if Nick is perfect conditioning like he always is, with all that mass, maybe not the best symmetry, but good symmetry, he could beat Samson if Samson's off. But Samson, with the amount of muscle mass he has on his body, and the way it flows, structurally speaking, when he's in the best shape of his life, he can't be beat. You know, that's just called having superior genetics. It sucks because you want to think, well, the biggest, hardest guy wins, but that's not always the case. You know, uh, there are, Marcus Rule would have been Mr. Olympia if that was the case. But, you know, he wasn't because he didn't have the best structure and he wasn't always in the best shape. He usually was in pretty good shape, though. But, that's the way it goes. So can Nick Walker beat those guys? Absolutely. If they're off a hair, he steps in there and he's right there beating them. Branch Warren did it for years. He beat guys that were much better than him structurally because he had the mass. He had freaky conditioning, you know, when he brought it. And he had graininess. And that's impressive when, 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 when you have a guy who should beat him but is a little bit, you know, not quite where he needs to be. So – Sam, guys like Samson and uh, Andrew have the advantage of holding their own destiny in their own hands because they're so good structurally that if they bring the muscle size and they bring the conditioning, they're almost unbeatable, you know, in today's, in today's bodybuilding world, you know, I mean, when Flex Wheeler was on, he couldn't be beat and he wasn't even the biggest guy. He just structurally was so much superior to everyone. And that's why genetics are such an important part of bodybuilding. You know, because you can't supersede genetics. If you don't have good genetics, you can be great, but you might, you'll might you never be the best. Now, if you have great genetics and you work hard and have a lot of muscle, Ronnie Coleman, you're unbeatable. And that's just the way the sport is. And so Samson hasn't gotten to the unbeatable stage yet. He won the Arnold, but he wasn't still wasn't his best conditioning-wise. When he brings his best conditioning-wise and brings his back up a little more, he will be very, very difficult to beat. Let's go to Made Man 1892. Would Testalize help someone with PCOS? And uh, the second question to that is, is there anything you would recommend for someone with it taking Testalize for weight loss? I mean, obviously there's Lipolize, but I think he's, I mean, that's a specific diet. So I don't know. I guess what would you generally recommend for somebody to pair uh, with Testalize? Yeah. Polycystic ovarian disease is, you know, a syndrome that women get where their adrenal glands crank out a lot of uh, DHEA, which can convert to testosterone in their body. And so they have high androgen levels, which means they usually have high DHT levels because testosterone can convert to DHT and they get side effects. They may get acne, they may get, you know, some hair growth on their body, on their face and stuff like that. Um, and it also is encompassed with insulin resistance, meaning their insulin doesn't work well. So they overproduce insulin. They tend to be fatter. You know, it's had a harder time losing weight. So those women do do well with testolize because testolize blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT. So it will alleviate a lot of those side effects like the acne and the hair growth on the face and maybe hair thinning on the head as they, as they get older. Great for that. Um, as far as the insulin resistance issue, you know, there are obviously a ketogenic diet doesn't help. They do better on low, low carb diets because, you know, they don't have to process the carbohydrates and, the, and their bodies can handle protein and fat better. Um, having said that, also the, the new class of GLP 1 agonist drugs out there like Ozempic and Manjaro, uh, those seem to work really well with, with PCOD2 because 
it, uh, it helps with insulin sensitivity and it, it increases output of, of insulin from the pancreas and it actually helps with weight loss. But my first line of defense would be number one, go with it with the DHT blocker like the Testalyze and give them a low carb diet. More ketogenic diets work really well with those women to lose the weight. Once they lose the weight, you can give them some carbs to eat. You just don't want to give them a lot of sugary carbs because they just don't process those well. Let's go to bu, 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 lift heavy set. Um, your thoughts on taking BPC-157 orally. Uh, does it, quote, survive oral ingestion or is it basically useless to take it this way? Yeah, I don't think it, uh, I don't think it has oral absorption um, really well because a lot of these peptide hormones, you know, they get, aside from the really small ones, like thi thyroid hormone is a peptide hormone that's really small. It sneaks through the stomach, no problem. That's why if you have to, like I take test, I take test, I take thyroid replacement because I don't have a thyroid gland, and you know I can take a pill every morning and I'm and I'm perfectly fine with that. But if you were to ingest growth hormone or IGF one or even BPC, they're they're a little too big and they usually get cleaved in the stomach because remember the stomach pumps tons of hydrochloric acid into the stomach and digestive enzymes and a lot of times these, these hormones get degraded. So they're not really that effective. If I'm going to use BPC-157, which I have used on my ankle uh, surgery, uh, initially I just kind of put it in my shoulder because I had a cast and on my foot. And as you know, as I had more access to my ankle and, it, and the swelling went down, I started putting it right into the under the skin, right above my ankle. And it, I, I really believe that it helped heal my um, help with the healing process tremendously. I just got a CT scan on my ankle uh, about last week. Because I was a little worried. So I'm still in a little pain walking around, but I was worried maybe I had a stress fracture or it didn't fuse properly. But they said it was it was completely fused like perfectly. And so I really accredit that to some of the, all the BPC I used from uh, I actually got it from Titan Medical. So uh, I got the pharmaceutical grade BPC and I also used the TB5 um, or TB400, as you guys know it as. And I alternated from week to week with the stuff. And it, it works well, you know, for what it's used for. It's not going to miraculously grow cartilage, you know, but it will help with healing. So if you get an injury, it seems to help uh, and effectively, you know, help heal it at a quicker rate. Let's go to uh, Alex Druin coach. I'm looking for an intro workout drink with electrolytes. Uh, how much sodium, potassium, et cetera, would you recommend to have enough for training day, but not too much. So I won't have any issues. Um, you know, given everything, you know, uh, is there, I mean, obviously there was what you used to have, um, you know, during the course of your competition career now, is there anything that you would recommend somebody to have, uh, intra workout? Right. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I would do intra workout, which was I really what I do anyway, but it doesn't matter because my workouts are not that hard. But if I was competing today, this is what I would use intra workout. I got it right here. Amino Evolved. Uh, when I made my amino product, you know, it's very high in essential fatty acids, excuse me, essential amino acids, you know, predominantly of, with branch chains being the predominant amount of essential fats, essential aminos. I'm so into this fat thing. I, I can't. <laughs> I would use those. We have electrolytes in Amino Evolved, sodium, potassium, so you don't have to figure it out. And then what I would do is I would put that inside of a Gatorade Zero. I really am. I'm telling you, I love these Gatorade Zeros. My favorite flavor is the um, the white cherry. So it's like a clear looking one. And uh, it's like a cherry flavor, but it, it has no color to it. I also like the grape ones, but that's my, the, the cherry clear ones are my favorite. Literally, I can drink a whole thing while I'm training, um, but I put the aminos in there. I shake it up. Uh, it's got tons of electrolytes. I never cramp in the gym when I use this stuff. And that was a big deal. And you can use this, you know, as long as you're not abusing it while you're even dieting, because there's no carbs in the amino evolved and there's no carbs in the um, in the Gatorade zeros. Now, if I was off season where I where I could drink some carbs, I probably I might go at a regular Gatorade with the amino evolved in there. Once again, the the electrolytes are the most important thing. A lot of people just don't eat enough salt. I salt the crap out of my foods, and I never understood why. But when I got DNA tested. I find I found out that I don't taste salt normally like i have a 50 percent deficit in salt. so what i think tastes salty is probably someone else might think is is overly salty you know and that's that's actually an advantage for me because a lot of people don't take enough salt in because they, they can't take the taste of it it's too much 
But as a bodybuilder who sweats a lot and uses these electrolytes on a, on a more regular basis than the average person, it's very easy to become de depleted of sodium and deficient in sodium, especially if you don't put a lot of sodium or salt on your foods. So try the Gatorade Zero with my product, Amino Evolve. Even if you didn't do the Amino Evolve, I like to just do it because I like the aminos in there while I'm training. But even if you didn't do that, you can do like whatever, you know, intra workout you're already doing and put it into a, a Gatorade Zero. I think that would work fine. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a question that we've actually gotten on a few different episodes. I didn't ask it. I didn't. I don't know if I felt it was a classy thing to ask, but then you did bring him up. I think it was on Heavy Muscle Radio this past Sunday night. Uh, Jocelyn Pell Pelletier, correct? That's how you pronounce that, Pelletier? Yes, Pelletier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Tony Wynn, I don't know, he's asked this question. I, I think he may have literally copy-pasted it for a few weeks. Yeah. Uh, Dave, a guy from the 90s era who competed, but not quite sure how he fit in with the rest of the pack. Jocelyn Pelletier, how did he turn pro and where is he now? Always seemed to place dead last when I read the competition's re results in the old Flex magazines. No offense, the guy was a pro, but looked way out of place up there most of the time next to the big boys. You know, I, I, I really don't know how he turned pro, to be honest with you. I think he won, uh, I'm trying to look it up right now so I can give you guys an accurate, uh, I, it was a Canadian, it had to be a Canadian show because he was a, ca a Canadian pro, so says 1976 Mr. International IFBB short class. So I'm assuming, and then the universe, he finished lightweight first. Uh, no, lightweight, he said 10th. Yes, he must have, the Mr. International must have been a pro club, but he actually looks good in the picture. So in 1976, he looked really good, but by the 90s, he was competing. If you guys, you know, used to go to Night of Champions every year, you'd see him. He was, you know, he looked like he couldn't win the Mr. Long. He couldn't win his class at the teenage Mr. Long Island. That's what he looked like. He he would always show up with no tan. I don't know what happened. Maybe he met, got something mentally went wrong with him. But he actually had a good physique from what I when I saw uh, when I looked up it online. And once he turned, once you turn pro, you can compete as a pro till you're 90 if you want. 100 years old, you know. Ronnie Coleman can get up there and and, and compete if he wants. I mean, it, why would he, right? Because he's all messed up. So like I'm all messed up. I'm not going to compete. But Jocelyn liked to compete. He was like a fixture every year at that night of champions, and people would laugh and you know because. It was like uh, you weren't sure if it was a joke or not, but he showed up every every year. So he and he had a, he must have been in his fifties at that point, because like I said, he turned pro back in Arnold's day. I mean, and he looked good. If you look at, I don't think I pull this. Let's look and pull this picture up. Sid, assuming I'm uh, this was really him. I'm assuming it is. I don't think there's anyone else with the, the same name. So he actually looked decent when he turned pro in the seventies, and then he, uh, you know, and then he kind of fell apart i don't know but uh it was always a it was always every year at night of champions you expected to see him up on that stage and he was always there take a couple of more questions so i'm glad we uh got that one uh put to rest um from Bilal hamide now in the past you've done i, I guess general advice videos regarding uh ramadan which is coming up in uh yeah one and a half weeks i think so uh yeah uh, this question is specific to advice regarding nutrition while dieting down. So I, mean, I, I guess if somebody is, has a show around the corner yet they plan on fasting, um, you know, or, you know, we've heard this a lot with, you know, a lot of bodybuilders in the middle East where, you know, they will literally sleep during the day, mm -hmm. stay up during the course of the night, you know, what eat, train, do whatever. But what we're talking about under a standard conventional, you're fasting during the day. Um, and you essentially only have sundown to sun sunrise to get your nutrition in. What, what would you advise to somebody who may be still, you know, trying to diet down, getting ready for a show? Yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to actually read you my. Um, my Ramadan schedule that I that I give out to my I wrote it a couple of years back because I realized that I had a lot of clients who who, would, you know, basically do Ramadan and. Unfortunately, it's always in the middle of the contest season. So if you're organized, however, you can make it work. The problem is that it messes up your sleep cycle because we're used to sleeping right at night and being awake during the day. And you know, so this seems to work. So my 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 protocol is as soon as the sun goes down and you can have you can actually eat something, do do your first meal, whatever the meal happens to be. You know, if you break fast with your family, fine. If you're dieting for a show and you have your first contest meal. That's meal one. 
an hour later, go to the gym and get the weights and cardio out of the way at this point with the meal down. Then as soon as you, as you're leaving the gym, drink a shake immediately after you finish your weights and cardio, come home. And then 90 minutes after that shake was, 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 was consumed, have another meal, have meal three, 90 minutes after that, have meal four. And then right before bed, which should be a decently normal, maybe it's only midnight at that point, um, have shake, uh, have a shake or a meal number five. Go to bed, and then before the sun rises, set your alarm, wake up, and have you know meal six, which could be really meal one for the day. It doesn't it doesn't matter. And if you if you do that, you're going to get all six meals eaten, and then just during the day, you're not eating anything. That's all. I mean, it it, it won't be that bad. You're not going to be missing anything. You have to just be really organized and set that schedule exactly like I just said. If you do that. I'm telling you, you'll get it done. And, it, and it's, it's only, you're only doing it for four weeks. It's not like it's, uh, it's four months or anything like that. So to me, a lot of people fail on Ramadan because they, they, they just don't, they're just not organized. We'll take one more question. Uh, good one here. Thought provoking. Another good thought provoking question from someone five feet behind. We've got some very creative uh, screen names that may poke around different <laughs> far corners of the internet. Who would you consider to be the most influential uh, or of the most influential bodybuilders uh, in bodybuilding of all time? He, he specifically mentions Vince Gironda, Larry Scott, Arnold, Tom Platt, Dorian. So in, in your opinion, the most influential bodybuilders when it has come to bodybuilding? You know, I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to take a more modern approach because I don't <laughs> think anyone today knows who Vince Gironda is unless you're my age. And so I don't think they're influential in the sense that people really follow. I think that Arnold has to be on the list because he'll always be relevant. And he's, and he's still relevant because he still has a show um, every year. So Arnold, definitely number one. I would say Bill Phillips. Now, a lot of people don't know Bill Phillips, but Bill Phillips was very influential. And he, even though he wasn't, you know, a competitive bodybuilder, you know, at least in, the, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a national sense, he – put the quantification of anabolic steroids and, and performance drugs and supplements on the map, as, as far as I'm concerned. And he really revolutionized things with the books he wrote, his body for life. He brought the mainstream America into the bodybuilding world. And I think that that can never be you know, forgotten. He also started EAS Nutrition, which he sold for a lot of money at some point. So I, I think he's very influential. Obviously, Joe Weider is very influential because of all the magazines. He, you know, he's the, the, the you know the, the, the godfather of, of bodybuilding, essentially. So you got Arnold, Bill Phillips, and 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 then Weider in, in terms of icons, I would say. And then, you know, I think that you know you have to throw someone like Ronnie Coleman in there. He's so pot, and I would put Jay Cutler in there. I think those two are like probably some of the most well-known bodybuilders of the modern era. Dorian was well known, but he really wasn't accessible that much. So he influenced guys of my generation, but I don't think he had a, a, a generate, you know, multi-generational effect on, on the industry. You know, the heavy duty system that he employed was really something that that Mike Menser made popular, uh, even though he didn't invent it, but he made it, it was Arthur Jones' system, but but Mike Menser made that popular. So as far as training systems go, maybe Dorian and Mike Menser together might be honorable mention, but I mean, Jay is is so well known. He he really, you know, made bodybuilding into a business, and and he's still doing it all through all these years. Ronnie is the best, greatest to ever compete. So that would be my list: Arnold, Bill Phillips, you know, Joe Weider, you know, with and I have to give my my good friend Lou Ferrigno honorable mention here because he was the Incredible Hulk, and so he made he made bodybuilding mainstream in terms of like TV and stuff like that. Everyone knew who the Incredible Hulk was, but I think that you know. Of the modern era, Jay and 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 Ronnie really uh, re really popularized bodybuilding, and I think people still can re relate to them even after all these years later after they're done, you know, competing. So that's my list, you know. And I'm sure I'm leaving off some very significant people, but that's just people who kind of pop into my head. That's gonna do for this episode of Ask Dave again on the channel right now. All new episode of Heavy Muscle Radio from Sunday night. We had drop ins. From a Guru Amin Ali, Carlo Filipponi, it was a great episode breaking down this past Arnold Classic and some of the controversies regarding judging. Really, really good, I, I guess, bodybuilding nerd conversation stuff. So you, if you haven't already seen it, go check it out. And then, of course, 
all new episode of After Hours yesterday, live episode with the Whack Pack. Uh, hilarity, Jimmy the Bull going off, mentions of I Dream of Genie. It was epic as always. And then, of course, tomorrow, all new episode of Iron Rage with Lee Priest. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.